Oh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Hope Church. If you're new, my name is Jason. I'm the lead pastor on staff. To those of you who got dressed and brushed your teeth, you don't have to brush your teeth, you're wearing a mask, but you came into, be, into church to be in the room this morning. I am so glad we get to be together. And would you please help me welcome everyone who's watching our service online today. Let's give them a loud hope welcome to church because no matter where you're at, we are one church because we have one God, we have one Savior, Jesus Christ, and we are one in faith and love for him. And I'm glad we can all be together this morning and open the scriptures together and be in God's presence together. So thank you for being here today. If you're new, you picked an incredible Sunday to be here for a couple of reasons. I'm not going to tell you the second reason until the end of our service. Uh, But the first reason why you picked a great Sunday to be here is because we're in part two of a series called You're Not the Boss of Me. And in this series, we are learning how to say no to the emotions that compete for control within your heart. This is a series about your heart. Now, when biblical authors talk about your heart, what they're talking about is your inner life. Now, we live in a culture that focuses on your outer life, what you look like, how physically fit you are, what your hair looks like, what you wear, what you drive, everything we can see, the words you say, uh, the behaviors that uh, we observe in you. We live in a culture that puts a lot of emphasis on your outer life. Now, That's not bad necessarily. Your outer life is part of who you are. Uh, You have a body. It's good to take care of it. But we live in a culture that completely pushes our attention towards your outer life, but doesn't help us pay attention to your inner life. Your inner life includes your thoughts, your emotions, your spiritual life, your soul, your consciousness, all these things that people can't observe. You can't see my inner life. I can't see your inner life. We can only see the outer life. But both biblical authors and common sense tell us that if you had to prioritize one over the other, your inner life is going to be more important if you're going to flourish as a human being. They're both important. I'm not saying one isn't important. But you perhaps know people who, on their outer life, things aren't going well, but they have a strong, healthy inner life. And as a result, even in their challenging circumstances in their outer life, they're flourishing, they're thriving, they're healthy, they're happy. Conversely, you probably know people who, on their outer life, everything's great. They're beautiful, they're wealthy, they're doing well, but in their inner life, they're not healthy. And as a result... They leave a trail of chaos behind them and dysfunction all around them. And they're stressed out and filled with anxiety and they're not very happy. The problem is, since we live in a world and a culture that teaches us to pay attention to our outer life, very few of us were ever taught how to cultivate a healthy inner life or how to cultivate a healthy heart. And that's what we're talking about in this series Because we live in a world, we were brought up in a world where we were taught just to monitor our behavior. That's why I find it interesting every once in a while when there's a survey that's published or a news story where people ask the question, interviewers ask the question, if you could do one thing and get away with it and not have any consequences, what's the one thing you would do? Now, have you ever read some of those answers? They are terrifying. The things people admit they would do if they could get away with it and never get caught and have no consequences because it's a question that's intentionally designed to say, if we could take out the filter between your inner life and your outer life and you could actually act on impulse and what your inner life wants you to do, what would you do? It's kind of alarming who your neighbors actually are. In fact, it's always weird. If you notice every time there's a mass shooting, The news crews show up at the person's home and they start interviewing the neighbors and they say, well, what was he like? And they always say the same thing. Well, he didn't really seem like the kind to go kill a bunch of people. He's kind of quiet. He kept to himself, but I never took him for a mass shooter. Have Have you ever seen those interviews? That's why this old onion headline always cracked me up. Neighbors remember serial killer as serial killer. And then if you read the article, they say, yeah, he always seemed like the serial killer type, and he really hated nurses. Anyway, that's probably just my weird sense of humor finding that entertaining. But we live in a culture where we know we have to put a filter in between our inner life and our outer life, but eventually that filter slips. And this is true for you. It's true for me. It's true for all of us. It it usually comes off at home, and those are the people who bear the brunt of it, but It's critical if we're going to be thriving people that we have a healthy inner life that you have and cultivate a healthy 
heart. So last week, we looked at a verse. It's a verse I come back to every few years. It's, it's for me, one of the most uh, important verses in the Bible when it comes to living a flourishing life, a thriving life. And we read this verse from Solomon in the book of Proverbs, where he wrote, above all else. And again, I cannot overemphasize this. This was a man who wrote about marriage. He wrote about dating. He wrote about relationships. He wrote about finances. He wrote about work ethic. He wrote about raising children. He wrote about having a good reputation and almost every aspect of life Solomon touched on with his wisdom. And if you read the book of Proverbs, even to this day, you will say, that's just helpful. That gives me insight on how to live. Solomon wrote, above all else, above everything else I have to say, in all of my wisdom, guard your heart, guard your inner life. Pay attention to the inner health of who you are. Cultivate a healthy inner life for it is the wellspring of your life. Your heart is the source from which all of your life emanates and flows. That's why your childhood might have been different if you had parents who understood how to cultivate a healthy inner life. This is why for some of you, your earlier years would have been different if you had learned how to cultivate a healthy inner life because everything that you do flows from your heart. Now today, and for the next two weeks, this is just a four-week-long series, we are targeting three very specific emotions that can get lodged in your heart and create dishealth within. Three emotions that as a pastor I see over and over again in the lives of people and I see the chaos they cause in people's lives if, if we do not learn how to deal with and clean out our hearts from these three emotions that clog them up. And today, what we're talking about is the feeling of guilt. Guilt is what we feel when we perceive that we have done something wrong. When you believe that you have done something wrong, inappropriate, and it's your fault, guilt is that feeling that creeps into our inner lives. Now, what's interesting about guilt, if you really break down how it impacts your inner life, how it impacts your heart, and how it impacts your relationship, is this. Guilt creates a relationship of indebtedness. Whenever you feel guilty, what you're feeling is a sense that you are relationally indebted to someone else. And there's three different parties that you feel this way with. The first is that sometimes the debt-to-debtor relationship is with another person. In fact, we even reflect this in our language when you feel guilty. When you feel guilty, you say, I owe him an apology. I'm sorry, you what? I owe him. Oh, you're indebted to him. Why are you indebted to him? Well, I said this thing I shouldn't have said. I did this thing I shouldn't have done. I took something uh, that wasn't really mine in terms of the relationship. So I owe him an apology. Or you say, I really need to make it up to her. Well, why do you need to make it up? Because what you're expressing is a debt-to-debtor relationship. Relationally, in some capacity, you understand that you are indebted to that person, not financially. Well, I guess it could be financially, but you are in some way indebted to that person relationally. So we say things like, I owe it to you. I need to make it up to you. Sometimes that debt-to-debtor relationship is with another person. You took something you should not have taken. Maybe you took something like their childhood. You weren't the parent you should have been. Or you took away their first marriage, or you took away their opportunity, or you took away uh, their reputation. But there's something where you did something and now you feel indebted to that person. Sometimes that's what guilt is telling you. There is a debt-to-debtor relationship with another person. Sometimes the debt-to-debtor relationship is with yourself. This is the, the lay awake at night kind of guilt where you are upset with yourself because you owed it to yourself to do something differently and you didn't. I shouldn't have spent that money. I shouldn't have drank that much. I should have taken better care of my health in the past. Whatever it is, uh, you feel indebted to yourself. And the third category is that sometimes the debt-to-debtor relationship is with God. God. 
Now, in my years as a pastor, this is the one that is falling off the most quickly, and this is the one that is gaining the most quickly. But if you go back 50 years, a lot of the debt-to-debtor relationship people felt in America anyway was in the sense of we have failed to live up to God's standards, and there is a holy God who has certain expectations for my life, and now I am indebted to God because of my sin. But that's how we experience guilt. And this is such a common phenomenon in human beings that psychologists have studied guilt and the implications it has for our lives extensively. So uh, I did a little research this week, and we actually found something in the Hope Archives that teaches us something about guilt. So let's take a look. I'm Pastor Professor. Welcome back to the wonderful world of psychological science. Today, we're talking about an unwelcome human emotion. It's what psychologists call guilt. Guilt is a negative affective state that occurs in response to a transgression or shortcoming. Guilt is what's known as an inhibitory emotion. An inhibitory emotion blocks access to core emotions in the human psyche, emotions such as joy or gratitude. It also inhibits full access to your brain's prefrontal cortex, making it difficult to focus or solve complex problems when the person feels guilty. Guilt is a major problem in the modern Homo sapien. The average American reports feeling mildly to moderately guilty about five hours per week. Also, people who report feelings of guilt report that they physically feel heavy and activities require an excess amount of energy. Since guilt is an inhibitory emotion, it's like having a snooze alarm go off in your brain all day long, distracting your focus and hijacking your energy for more important tasks. So, now you know why guilt makes you feel like you're carrying around a heavy burden. All thanks to the wonder of psychological science. I just always find that guy's explanation so helpful and enlightening. But there's two additional problems that guilt brings to the table that we haven't uh, even discussed yet. And the first additional problem is that guilt never stays alone as guilt. Guilt always metastasizes. Guilt always evolves into something different. And here's what it evolves into. Guilt evolves into anger. If you do not resolve feelings of guilt in your life, it eventually evolves into anger. And when you feel guilty, who are you angry at? Who are you angry at when you feel guilty? You're angry at yourself. And when anger grows inside of you, it never stays in its original lane. It always spills over into the other lanes of your life. This is why you've possibly met some elderly people who are just mad at the world. They did not start out mad at the world. They started out mad because of one reason. A lot of times it's guilt and they're mad at themselves. But anger starts to generalize if you don't resolve it and it grows in your life. This connection is the reason why we're starting with guilt this week instead of anger. Originally, when we designed this series, uh, we were going to talk about anger this week because uh, realizing that there's an election this week, uh, half the country is going to be angry. But I think if we let it play out by this time next week, I'm pretty sure the whole country will be angry again. So I wanted to talk about anger next week, but also because there's a connection between guilt and anger. And if you do not know how to resolve guilt, you will not have leverage to resolve anger in your life. The two go together. An unresolved guilt always evolves into anger. The second problem is that feeling of weight that guilt brings. That psychologists can even observe this in what they learn in their patients. That unresolved guilt makes you feel heavy. It saps your energy and it compounds over the years. Guilt you pick up in your childhood that you do not resolve it compounds into your teen years. The guilt you pick up in your adolescent years that you do not resolve, it compounds and grows into your adult years. The guilt you picked up as a single person that you do not resolve, it gets carried into your marriage. It gets carried into your parenting. That's how guilt works. It's like adding rocks to a backpack on your back every time you move into a new season of life. That burden gets heavier and heavier and heavier. Today, 
many of us are carrying around a heavy burden of guilt. And the reason why we do that is because guilt is so impossible to resolve, isn't it? I mean, if the whole feeling of guilt is a feeling of indebtedness, that means the only way to get rid of the feeling of guilt is to pay off the debt. The problem is most of what you feel guilty about can't be repaid. You can't go back and do your freshman year all over again. Well, I guess you can for about $25,000 a year. You can't go back and reparent your kids. You can't go back and, and undrink that much. You can't unsay what you said. You can't un, unfaithful your unfaithfulness. You can't go back and, and redo what you wish you had done right the first time. It's already there. It's already history. It already happened. And you can't undo it. If there was something you could do to make it up, you would just make it up and then you would be free from guilt. But so much of what we feel guilty about cannot be undone. And so we feel stuck with it. And as a result, in order to try and alleviate the burden, we do one of two things as human beings to psychologically try and protect our sanity. Number one, we justify it and pretend it never happened, or we sand off the rough edges of it, or we say a story, we tell ourselves a narrative to say, well, it really wasn't that bad, it really was her fault, well, he's really the reason why I did this way, and if she hadn't, then I wouldn't have had. And we kind of tell ourselves this narrative to sand off the rough edges of what we actually did so we don't have to feel quite as accountable for it, or the opposite is we just wear that scarlet letter and we let it beat us down. And you say, I'm just a terrible person. I'm a horrible person because I have done these horrible things. Today, what we're going to learn is that there's a third way to resolve guilt. Here's what we're going to learn today. You do not have to deny your past. In fact, what's so liberating about what we're going to discover today is you do not have to pretend, you do not have to excuse, you do not have to justify, you do not have to keep telling the same lies you have always told, and you do not need to blame anybody else for what you have done in your past that you are responsible for. There is a way where you can fully own your actions and failures and sins from the past. You don't have to deny it. And... You do not have to be defined by your past. There is a third way where you do not have to deny your past and you do not have to be defined your past. And what we're going to learn today is the Jesus way. The Jesus way of resolving guilt. And the reason why what I'm going to share today has so much power and so much credibility is not because it's my idea. I'm going to read you something that was written by a man named Paul. And if anybody had credibility on the topic of resolving guilt, it was the Apostle Paul because he entered the scene as Saul of Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus was a good Jewish man. He was a Pharisee and actually hated Christians and persecuted Christians. So early in his career, he imprisoned Christians. He, he got permission and letters to travel to other jurisdictions and arrest Christians, imprison them, oversee their trials. And in some instances, we're told he oversaw the execution of Christians, Jesus followers. He oversaw their deaths because they were guilty of following Jesus. They were guilty of having faith in Jesus. That was Saul. And then he met Jesus. And then he suddenly realized that everything they had been saying is true, that Jesus not only died on a cross for our sins, but he walked out of the tomb on the third day. He rose on the third day, and Saul repented. He changed. He began to love Jesus. He began to love God. He spent the rest of his life loving God and serving God. But there is a problem. Now that he's a Christian... His new circle are the people whose relatives, whose siblings, whose parents, whose children, whose cousins he had just been persecuting. He had just been arresting. He had just been torturing. He had just been overseeing their executions. All of a sudden, he comes in to the church as a Christian. He says, hey, guys, my bad. My, right? That's what we say. My bad. Uh, did, didn't know. Sorry. Sorry about your cousin. He was a nice guy. If anyone, I, I mean, I can't imagine how guilty he would feel to try and walk into the church after doing what he did. Yet Saul of Tarsus 
adopted a new identity as a child of God. He adopted a new name as Paul and became the Apostle Paul. And he has something to say about how to live a life where you do not have to deny your past because Paul never sanded off the rough edges of what he did. He never blame shifted. He never said, well, I was under the influence of these Pharisees and they taught me wrong and I believed it and I was young and naive and I didn't know any better. No, he, he didn't blame shift. He owned his past. He did not deny his past, but he was not defined by his past. And he teaches us how to live a life free from guilt when you have absolutely done wrong, when you have absolutely failed, when you are absolutely in debt to someone else or to yourself or to God. And he shows us the way in Romans chapter 8. Here's what he wrote. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, no condemnation, that's actually a legal term from their generation. Condemnation means you've been accused, you've been tried, you've been convicted, and now you are condemned. This is the end of the legal process where it is on you. You are legally guilty of something. Paul says there is a way in God's courtroom, in the courtroom of the almighty divine judge, where you can be accused, arrested, you can be tried, and you can be declared not guilty for the crime. And he says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now I'm going to come back to that in a little bit, but that's an important idea being in Christ Jesus. And he explains why. Because, because you're thinking what his audience thought, but wait, if I did something, I'm guilty. If I did something, I deserve to be condemned. And Paul said, no, 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 not if you're in Christ Jesus. And here's the reason why. Because through Christ Jesus. In other words, apart from Christ Jesus, this wasn't true, but now this new channel has opened up. This third way has opened up. It used to be deny your past and blame someone else and pretend it wasn't a big deal or justify it, or it was be broken by your shame and guilt. He says, no, there's a new way through Christ Jesus, a third way. Because through Christ Jesus, and he gets technical here, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now, I want to pack, unpack these two ideas, the law of the Spirit who gives life and the law of sin and death. Paul is saying, spiritually speaking, in the world we live in, there is a law of sin and death. When you sin, you will be condemned. In fact, it has many, many tentacles to it. If you sin, something dies is the short version of it. If you sin, a relationship dies. If you sin, uh, options die. If you sin, your reputation dies. Something dies every time you sin. But something that also dies is your relationship with God because when you fail to live a holy life as God is holy, you are cut off from his presence. And when you sin, your relationship with God dies. That's the law of sin and death. He says, but the law of the Spirit who gives life sets you free from the law of sin and death. Now, um, let me explain it this way. In physics, there are certain laws, right? There's the law of gravity. If you drop something, it falls every single time because the earth has mass. But there's another law in physics. It's the law of aerodynamics. Now, when you get into an airplane, is the law of gravity suddenly suspended? Nope, the law of gravity still works just fine, but the law of gravity is overcome by a new law, the law of aerodynamics, which is why you can cruise along at 30,000 feet watching your favorite movie. What Paul is saying is that in our world, there is a law of sin and death. And that's a true law, and it happens every time. Yet at the same time, there's another law which overpowers it, and the law is the spirit who gives life and has set you free. The law of the Spirit who gives life. There is life through God. There is forgiveness through God. There is justification through God. And it is for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
See, when, when we talk about believing in Jesus, we, we think about it almost like believing in the Easter Bunny or believing in Santa Claus. But if you understand how those Greek speakers wrote their words, they actually wrote believe into Jesus, which doesn't really sound good in English. Like um, John 3.16, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, literally it's whoever believes into him. Whoever leans into him, whoever finds their identity in him, their hope in him. In baptism, it says you are united with Jesus in his death and resurrection. You are leaning into him. When you trust in him, when you put your faith in him, when you're baptized into his name, you take on his identity as God's forgiven son, as God's forgiven child. So Paul says, through the Spirit, when you trust in Jesus, there's a transfer that takes place. And the law of the Spirit who gives life, who gives eternal life, sets you free from the law of sin and death. Now, that's still pretty theological and abstract, so he explains it a little more in the next verse. He says, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. I want to pause right there. For what the law, he's talking about God's law. He's talking about the Ten Commandments. There's moral things you should do, and there's things you ought not to do. Here are some good things to do. Here are some things you ought not to do. Guilt shows up when we look at all the things that we should do, according to the Bible, according to the Ten Commandments, according to your own conscience. There are things that are right, and there are things that are wrong. And when you fail to do the things you ought to do, when you do the things you ought not to do, you're condemned. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. In other words, what cannot the law do? What is it powerless to do? To take away your guilt. To take away your shame. To make you acceptable to God. Think about it this way. Let's say you're driving along and you're speeding, and I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about other people who are wicked sinners, and you're speeding, and you get pulled over, and you're going 15 over, and the officer says, uh, yeah, I can't give you a warning. You're going 15 over. I'm going to write you up a ticket. But you say, but officer, if you look down the road, there's a stop sign down there. How about I just come to a complete stop at that stop sign, and then we're good, right? No, because adding another law does not make you okay for the law you already broke. You already broke it. That's what the Ten Commandments do. Once you already feel guilty, it doesn't work to start keeping other laws of God. Now, I will be the first to acknowledge the church has tried to leverage guilt for centuries with this kind of thinking. Oh, you feel guilty for what you've done. Maybe you should give more money. Maybe you should be a better person. And we try to add laws and add rules thinking, well, maybe if I keep those laws, those rules over there, maybe now God will be okay with me for the ones I already broke. Paul says, not a chance. The law is powerless to save you because it's weakened by the flesh, by our sinful nature, the part of us that rebels against God. So for what the law was powerless to do, check this out, God did. God did. What was the law powerless to do? Save you. Make you pleasing in God's sight. God already did that for you. How? By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. Now, that doesn't make sense to us, but to a Jewish audience, that made tons of sense. In the Old Testament, they had sacrifices they had to give, and there was one sacrifice. It was called the sin offering, and this would have been so embarrassing. When you, like, really sinned, you had to take the sin offering to the tabernacle, and you had to take it to the priest. So if you're just put a lamb on a leash, and you're walking to the temple, all your neighbors know, oh, you did something bad, didn't you? Yep, taking my lamb to the temple, taking my lamb to the tabernacle. And you had to take it to the priest, and you had to confess the sins over it, and the priest would slaughter the lamb vicariously for you as a symbol of saying, you're guilty, and now this innocent party is going to take the hit. The reason why in the Hebrew Scriptures they were to observe the sin offering is because it was foreshadowing what Jesus would do. All those sacrifices were there to point ahead to the true and greater sacrifice, the true and greater sin offering, Jesus Christ himself. What we couldn't do through obedience to God, which is why we feel guilty, God did for us. God did for you through Christ Jesus. Jesus.
He became a sin offering in your place. He became that lamb that was sacrificed for your sin. God sent his son to do that. He explains it a little more in the very next verse, verses 3 and 4. And so he condemned, God condemned sin in the flesh. Because if God's going to be good and if God's going to be just, if someone sins, they must be punished We say, why is that just? Because when you look at the world we live in and you see people who do horrible things, you want them to be held accountable, don't you? Why is that? It's because you were made in the image of God. When you see horrible people doing horrible things, you want them to be held accountable because you were made in the image of God. And God would not be a good God if he let sin go unchecked and unpunished. So what he does, because he's good, is he punishes sin. But because he is loving... He condemned Jesus in your place. He condemned Jesus in your place in order that the righteous requirement of the law, what the Ten Commandments say, what God says is good, what your own conscience said is good, what God demands of you through Jesus Christ is fully met in us. Because God takes what Jesus did and he gives it to you as a gift. And and I need you to know this, church. I need you to know this, those of you who feel guilty right now. When God looks at you in Christ Jesus, the thing that is weighing you down, the thing that is being a burden for you, the thing that you regret, he doesn't even see. looks at you, he sees Jesus. When he looks at you, he sees his child. When he looks at you, he sees love. Why? Because Jesus was your sin offering, because it's already been paid for, and God is just. And it would be unjust for him to hold against you the sin that has already been paid for. God's canceled the debt. He's canceled the debt. You might be hanging on to it. God is not hanging on to it. He has canceled the debt for those of us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. This means we have a new hope. That new hope is Jesus. We have a new purpose. That new purpose is Jesus. And saying what he's done for us so that we're not stuck excusing our past and excusing our sin but we have the courage to own and say, yeah, I really sinned. I don't need to deny my past, but it doesn't define who I am. Jesus defines who I am. We live according to the spirit who gives life and that sets us free from death. Now, before I go on with some of the implications for your life and how to apply this and work this in to the guilt you might be feeling today, I wanna pause and really let this sink in. So I asked the band to come out and lead us in a song about this. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measures That He should give His own His treasure How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the chosen ones Bring many sons to glory Shame, I hear my 
For the balance of our time, I want to talk about four implications that this has for you and your life when it comes to addressing the feelings of guilt that weigh you down. The first implication is this. You have lost the right to condemn yourself. I want you to see this from God's perspective for a moment. You have a maker that you will answer to for your life. He's the judge. Think of how extremely arrogant it would be to tell the maker of the heavens and the earth whether or not he's judging correctly. You have no basis for a statement like that. You have no basis for a thought like that in your head. And what that means is, if God has declared you vindicated, if God has declared you justified, if God has declared you forgiven, if there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who exactly do you think you are to say, but I'm guilty? Who are you to say, well, I, I, I'm indebted? Who are you to say that? If God says you're forgiven, if God says you're my beloved, if God says you're my child, you lost the right to condemn yourself. You lost the right to hold on to guilty feelings in your life. Because if you do, you're arguing with God who said, it's gone. As far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your transgressions from you. You lost the right to condemn yourself. The second one we don't like. That one's fine. This one's a problem. You lost the right to condemn others. If, if God has treated you this way, if God has looked at you with everything you've done and said, I'm redeeming you for a new future, you can't write anybody off at that point. We can't condemn people for where they're at. We can't condemn people for their brokenness and sin. Our goal is to come alongside people and redeem them, restore them, turn them in a new direction. But we can't write people off. We lost the right to condemn others, to judge others. Again, there's one judge. His justice is perfect. His judgment is perfect. We can't write people off. We lost the right to condemn others. We'll get into that more next week. Third, you are free to make restitution without expectations and excuses. When your debt to debtor relationship is with another person, if you are in Christ Jesus, it means you have a new level of freedom to go do what you can do to make things right. Now, you can't make things right with someone else if you're indebted to them. You can't. If you owe someone an apology, all you can do is apologize. You cannot fix the relationship. All you can do is do what you can do to try to make restitution, but if they don't want to forgive you, you can't expect that or demand that of them. But you're free because God does not condemn you to not sand off the rough edges of what you did, but to go and own what you did to that other person. In fact, there might be some people in your life, and and your apology, your making of restitution is going to be the thing that sets them free from bitterness they've been hanging on to. But their response doesn't matter. 
You're free because you're forgiven. So you're free to make restitution without any expectations on them and without making any excuses about yourself. And the last thing is this. Your guilt will still pop up now and then. And it will remind you, but it will not define you. Do you know what it will remind you of? It will remind you that you really have sinned, and that's serious. It, It will remind you how far you still fall from what it means to live a God-pleasing life. It'll remind you of that, but more importantly, it will remind you that as bad as your sin is, Jesus was that much more loving. It will remind you that Jesus already forgave that sin at the cross. It will remind you of the depth of God's love, how deep the Father's love for us. It will remind you of the future you have. It will remind you that your identity is in Jesus, not in your performance. It will remind you that what you were powerless to do, God did on your behalf. I loved how the theologian Martin Luther approached this idea. He said, if you're going to sin, then go sin boldly. Go own it. Say, yeah, I did. It was bad. Let me tell you how bad my sin was. But he said, but trust in Jesus more boldly. So that when that guilt pops up in your inner life, it doesn't define you anymore. It reminds you, yeah, I was so sinful Jesus had to die, but he's so good that he was glad to do it. So two things I want to close with today. First is this idea that my past will remind me it will not define me. My past will remind me it will not define me. I want to do two things. If you're watching online, I want you to write that in the chat. My past will remind me. This is our declaration. It will not define me. For those of us in the room, I want you to read this with me. My past will remind me. It will not define me. Now let's read it like you're a really bad sinner and you believe this. My past will remind me. It will not define me. Jesus defines you. Not your past. And that's what lets us declare this statement. Guilt, you are not the boss of me. Ah, guilt, I see what you're doing there. You are taking my eyes off Jesus and focusing them on me. Guilt, this was never about me. You're taking my eyes off Jesus, so I focus about what I've done. Guilt, this is not about what I've done, what I was powerless to do. God did by sending his son, Jesus. He did it. It is done. Guilt, you are not the boss of me. Jesus is the boss of me. Shame, you don't love me. Guilt, you didn't die for me. Embarrassment, you didn't forgive my sins. Jesus did all of that for me. So you can remind me, guilt. You can remind me how good God is. You can remind me how loved I am. You can remind me all day long about my future in heaven because you do not define me. Jesus does. So guilt, you're not the boss of me. Let's pray. Jesus, this is easy to talk about. It is so challenging to work into our inner lives and live healthy hearts. So I pray for those of us listening who struggle with chronic guilt, that today we would know how deep your love is for us, that the sins we have committed have been atoned for through the blood of your son, Jesus. They were so bad, your own son had to die for them. That is true. And you are so good that you couldn't imagine eternity without us, and you did that on our behalf. Give us freedom from guilt by taking our eyes off ourselves and taking our eyes off our failure. Fill us with the joy and the marvel and the wonder that comes from knowing that you already took care of it so that we can have the freedom that comes from a healthy heart, a healthy inner life that has been set free by you to love you and love others. I pray that our past, our guilt, it'll just be a reminder a reminder of who you are, and it will remind us of who we are as your children. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.